right now is a challenging moment for everyone because the speed at which the world changed for all of us right now, I think was lightning, you know, and getting adjusted. It's a, what a disruption, right? But there's so many moments right now where people are responding with creativity. And when we all come out of this pandemic, I think it's going to be incredible because we're going to see, you know, the stories that you hear in college where someone, we at least this was a story in college, people be working on these paintings for a month. A painting professor would come in, stick a brush in, a, a, you know, in, in a can of paint and just flick it across everybody's canvas, you know, and people were crying because they had spent all of this time, you know, making this work. And he just went in and totally disrupted it and was like, okay, how are you going to respond to this? This moment is one of those moments. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Nora, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. Thanks for having me. So I actually heard uh, about your work from somebody on your team. And when I started doing some digging, uh, I just saw that you are this sort of very multidimensional person, which is always fascinating to me, uh, because I think that we're so often defined by sort of this one thing that we do. And yet, when you start to look deeper, particularly with artists, I find that they tend to be really multifaceted, which are my favorite kind of artists. But before we get into your work, I want to start by asking, what did your parents do for a living? And what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made throughout your life and your career? Hmm. Interesting. So, uh, so my father was, uh, a Kmart manager and, uh, my mother was, uh, until I was probably like 11 or 12, she was, you know, a homemaker. And the, I guess the interesting or the impactful thing about that was that we moved, um, we moved all of the time. I think I lived nine places before I was 12 because my father would get promoted. And then th- that meant that you got a bigger Kmart store to manage, which, you know, there was usually only one or two in these like smaller towns we were living in. And so we were constantly, we were constantly moving. Uh, so I was always the new kid. And, uh, sometimes I remember being at school and then kind of being confused, like not being able to picture like my house or my room because I had had so many. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so both, um, you know, my parents came from very working class Midwestern families. Yeah. So, I mean, being from working class family, um, you know, if, I, I'd imagine that kind of like an immigrant family, the thing that they would encourage in their children is to pursue stability when it comes to their career. And I'm curious, uh, what advice based on their own background and experience did your parents encourage or give you about, uh, you know, what you were going to do with your life? Well, uh, I guess when there's a picture of me when I was like nine months old holding like a yellow legal pad. Uh, and a pen. And my mom said, that was your favorite toy. I was like, why, why were you giving like a nine month old legal pen? But I guess it was like that. I'd gone through all the drawing uh, paper. So, you know, I was uh, really, really, uh, apparently really advanced in terms of um, being able to draw and think visually as a really small child. So that was just something that was undeniable. And, and my family would say, we have no idea where you got this from. Um, the funny thing is, is then later, uh, you know, my parents wanted to be supportive of the fact that I, you, you know, I was, a, I always had an artistic bend, but they didn't quite understand. I think like many people, how that plays out in, in, in the real world, you know, what that's like. So when I was, uh, 27, I was teaching art at a college, a private college in Ohio and decided that was what I had thought I I wanted to do. And I think it was mostly because being from a working class family and being interested in art, getting a tenure track job was kind of the only option that provided, you know, health insurance and tenure and retirement. And one day I just woke up and realized that like, it was really kind of a failure of imagination that I had 
pursued that for so many years because it seemed like the only option. And I thought there's got to be something else. So um, I finished up that uh, contract at the university and decided to move to New York and I had no job. And before I left, I, I was visiting my mother. We went out to dinner at this diner and she said, so, you know, when you move to New York, you're going to go get a job at the art firm at an art firm. And I (laughs) was like, what mom, an art firm. She's like, yeah, an art firm. I said, okay, tell me about this art firm, mom. She said, well, you know, it's like uh, everybody, all the artists come to work and they make art together for people and companies and, and they buy it. And I must've just looked so completely confused because she finally said, you know, nor like a law firm, but for artists an art firm. <laughs> that was my response too. But by the time we, she got to the end of it, she was so earnest about it that I felt bad. And I looked at her and I said, that doesn't exist. And then this look of like kind of sheer terror came over her face. And she said, well, then, and her voice got quiet. She's like, well, Nora, what are you going to do? And I, I felt horrible because I was, I had two degrees, you know, at that point I was, uh, in my late twenties and my mother was terrified for, you know, my well being, I guess. And I said, I, I don't know, you know, and, um, and I moved to New York and then honest to God, I had completely forgot about that exchange until one day, you know, years later, I walked into the image think office I looked around at all the people who had arts degrees that were creating visuals for companies. And I thought, oh, my God, like, I, why was I laughing at my mom um, here? You know, here's the art firm. So, yeah, that's I think that for years they still don't really understand what I do or yeah. what Image Think does. But uh, <laughs> I think that's the parent of any creative child. Like, it's I, true. Yeah, for, yeah. For, for the longest time, my parents, my dad was convinced that I worked with computers, and he would just tell people that. And I was like, you know, Dad, I use computers to create things. I like, <laughs> I like, everybody <laughs> works with computers, actually, yeah. at this point. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think the thing that struck me most about what you said was this whole idea of a failure of imagination. Was there any event or experience in your life that prompted that? And why do you think some people actually act on that failure of imagination at some point in their life and others do nothing? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know what prompted it uh, other than like, have you ever had the experience where you work really hard to get something and then you realize that you're, it's actually worse than in some ways not achieving it because you achieve it. And then you realize it's not really uh, all it was cracked up to be, you know? Uh, And that there's this sort of feeling of like the ground disappearing out from underneath you. Cause you're like, this is the thing that I've been pursuing for so long. And I think maybe some people, stick with that because it's such a scary thought to look in the face of, of the goal or the motivation that you had and recognize that you no longer, that it's, it's no longer there in the same way, or you no longer want that thing you were pursuing. Um, but I actually think that sometimes artists can be, look, like as artists, we have to create our own parameters, right? Especially in in contemporary society, right? Like when anything can be Uh, a piece of art, you know, and that's not just visual art, you know, John Cage, it's like 17 seconds of silence is a piece. So, you know, you not only are you creating something, but you have to kind of create a reason to say, like, why are you making a, a, a painting and not a sculpture? And why is it oil? Or why is it acrylic? Or why is it a dance piece and not something else? So as artists, we create a lot of rules for ourselves because we have to, because otherwise everything is potentially subject matter. Everything is potentially a medium and that openness would be paralyzing. So we create a lot of parameters. And I think that sometimes I've done this to myself. This, this is maybe an example, and I've definitely seen it with uh, with other artists, whether they're students or, or even folks I work with. Sometimes those parameters that we create are so necessary, but they we can think inside the box just as likely as anybody else. It's just that we've created our own constraints. Do you mm. know what I mean? Have you noticed that as being someone who's sort of interviewed, you know, creative people um, as as your profession? 
Yeah. I, I mean, I think that to me, constraints are sort of a necessity for real creative thinking, but it's like you said, it's just chaos. Otherwise, like I have very clear constraints of, okay, our show is an hour. I don't care if you're Oprah. If you don't give me an hour, the answer is no. Um, <clears throat> and it's like, we've literally turned down Pulitzer prize winning authors for that reason. And, uh, and it served us well, but I mean, that's a, a weird example, but I, I get what you're saying. I think that it, it otherwise, yeah, absolutely. It can feel like utter chaos, uh, which, which makes me wonder, you know, you were teaching students at, in college and my guess is you probably have a lot of young people who come in and work for you as well. Um, what is the advice that you give those people about pursuing this sort of nonlinear career in which we all know nothing is guaranteed and anything is possible? Oh my God. Uh, the, I, I'm still figuring that out. I was just, uh, I was just visiting a friend who, who I taught with at this university that I left. Actually, we both moved to New York and now he teaches basically this magical high school. It's like fame, uh, with all these talented creative people. And I gave a, 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 a talk to them. It's probably the last trip I'll be on for months and months at this point. Right. But, you know, kind of to that end where I was trying to at least like crack open this idea that just that your creativity is valuable in many different realms, but you have to kind of make the space for it. Right. So I had at that age been like, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be an art teacher. I'm going to make art. And this is the way I'm going to pay my bills. And I didn't, I failed to, to consider anything else. I just didn't have the tools. Um, but I, I guess, follow what makes you excited in a way. And at image think we have one of our company values is look while leaping, which everyone in the world, I feel like right now is being asked to look while leaping, right? We're all pivoting right now to the way that we're operating in the world. Uh, you know, I'm in New York inside my house. So, uh, sometimes it's like, follow what makes you excited and it's going to be a little scary. And, you know, mm. just, just push ahead and, and those opportunities then unfold. Yeah. Well, so it, it's funny that you mentioned that the opportunities unfold. Um, there's a woman named Rachel Friedman who wrote a book called uh, Creativity and the Imperfect Art of Adulthood, which actually traces the career paths of young people who were like just, you know, destined for artistic genius who actually didn't end up uh, in the careers they thought they would. And I think that that to me is one of those things where, uh, it, there's sort of an acceptance that you have to go into this with that it might not actually work out in your favor. And, you know, I, I wonder how, I mean, I, I know from having read some of your story that this is an all smooth sailing. So how do you navigate that extremely uncertain early part of it without losing your mind? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I guess, you, you use the thing that has gotten you in that situation in the first place, right? Which is the inspiration and the thing that excites you. And you ride that, you hold on to that thing, you know, and right now, um, you know, there's so much anxiety in the world right now, right now in my business, right? Most of what image think does is, is predicated on being in person meetings uh, and, I'm really, really excited about all of these new, new ideas and new content and new directions we can go. And you kind of have to just like lean into that um, because there is so much, uh, otherwise there is so many, there's so much adversity and there's so much challenge. And it, 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 you said the path is not charted. So um, that's the thing that you, you just, you just lean into and, you know, it will take you somewhere. That's, mm -hmm. That's my thought on the, on it. Um, another thing that I would say that that someone said to me, a mentor of mine, Adrian Salinger, a, amazing photographer, a, a, a amazing teacher, said, you know, if you're if you're doing something that you're sort of scared by, then you know you're going in the right direction. And if you're not sort of afraid of your own work, then you know, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. And that has really served me very well because, you know, I think that everybody, whatever your medium is, there's a point where you're like kind of tinkering with something and you're mm -hmm. excited by it, but you're like, also like, is this just too weird? Is this just too random? Um, 
And when you have those doubts, I've now I kind of take those doubts as an indication that uh, that you're onto something, you know, yeah. and not shy away from it. So yeah. possibly the best artistic advice I was ever given. So we know a lot of you have been listening to us for years, and it means the world to us. What we do here at The Unmistakable Creative wouldn't be possible without the support of our listeners. If the podcast has been valuable to you, one of the best ways you can support us is to subscribe to Unmistakable Creative Prime. It gives you access to transcripts, all of our courses, monthly coaching calls, live chats with our guests, and an incredible community of creators. And it costs less than you spend on a cup of coffee every month. For the school teachers and deep learner education system, Prime is completely free to help you with this transition to teaching online. We've packed it with a ton of value and actionable content, and we hope you'll check it out. Just go to unmistakablecreative.com slash prime to learn more. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash prime. I do want to come back to the idea of choosing a medium for my own selfish reasons, because I'm, I'm teaching a, a mastermind course. And today, the module that I have to complete for them for this week is you know choosing your medium. But before we get that, one of the things I wonder is, what is the poorest or most desperate you ever remember being in this process? And did you ever want to just give up? Well, what's the process? Life? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, it, it, in, in terms of reaching where you have today. Um, what is the poorest and most desperate you ever remember being? Well, I think, I think they're two separate things. The poorest I remember being and the most desperate I I ever remember being, I think are different. Um, Hmm. because when, um, yeah, being, being poor is, is, uh, is hard, especially living in New York, you know, when you can, I find it felt like when I moved, did move to New York after I had the conversation with my mom in the diner that I, um, I could see outside the window. I was like outside seeing like all this fantastic stuff the city had and not really being able to fully like participate in it, you know? Um, but at the same time, I think the most desperate I, I felt is when I had more to lose, when I had more success, when I had, there was more on the line and maybe more ego around it. Um, so those are, are maybe two different things. Um, mm. You know, the, you know, this is, you know, the, right now is a challenging moment for everyone because the, the speed at which the world changed for, for all of us right now, I think is, is was lightning, you know, and getting adjusted. It's a, what a disruption, right? But there's so many moments right now where people are responding with creativity. And when we all come out of this pandemic, I think it's going to be incredible because we're going to see, it is like, you know, the stories that you hear in college where someone, we, at least this was a, this was a story in college, a, a painting professor would have somebody, they, people would be working on these paintings for a month. And then he would come in, stick a brush in, a, a, you know, in, in a can of paint and just flick it across everybody's canvas, you know, and people were crying because they had spent all of this time, you know, making this work. And he just went in and totally disrupted it and was like, okay, how are you going to respond to this? You know? Um, so that, you know, I think that this moment is one of those moments. Um, so speaking of, uh, mediums, how in the world did you discover this of, of all the things? Like what was the path that led you to discover this? Cause I know that you do a bunch of different things. Like I know you're a photographer. Cause I think it was your photography work that when I looked at it, I was like, Oh, this is fascinating. That was oh, kind of yeah, my, okay, yeah. I know I heard that. That's so great. Yeah. Which, photog- it was funny because I wasn't sold until I looked at that before. Then I went back to image think I was like, image that I was like, we've had people talk about visual thinking, but then when I looked at your photography, I was like, okay, now I want to actually, that was what got me. Yeah, I love that. I'd love to talk to you more about my photography. But when you talk about mediums, it's interesting because, you know, when I was young, when I was very young, um, photographers seemed so like sexy and my mother would never let me touch the family camera. It was like too expensive. I would waste the film. I mean, now it's like crazy because you see like, you know, two year olds carrying around their parents' cell phones, but it's probably her fault. I got into photography because it was this thing I couldn't, I couldn't do. Um, so I moved to, into it from, you know, more traditional mediums and the, um, the irony was, is that I was really impatient and I thought it would be, you know, I could say what I wanted to say faster, but then I was so technical and I would be in the dark room and I'd be printing millions of pictures. And, uh, and then I, I really pushed it to be about socializing So uh, a lot of the work, especially uh, I have a long history of doing these sort of social portraits is around thinking about how people behave when a camera is out and how we make these performances for the camera, 
you know, and, um, and, you know, of course now with it, it, we're all so savvy about managing our own images. Um, but that, that became in a way something that was really exciting because then I could use photography as an excuse to kind of engineer relationships or see how people interacted together. So for instance, I did these like pop-up studios that were built structures. The first one was in Chelsea in, in New York and, you know, put these like cheesy backdrops, which is like a whole nother body of work I did around JC Penney portrait studios and those kind of portrait studios you were brought to as a kid. And people in the street would walk by and I would get them to pose with strangers as if they were family members or as if they were intimates, wow. you know, and it was so fun. And it was so fun to see how people interacted and crafted these moments that didn't exist. These people didn't have relationships. They wouldn't have interacted except that there was a camera there. And I found that to be um, so, so interesting. Hmm. So, you know, the, in that case, like it was, I love photography, but, um, I got, you know, as it evolved and I, I kept working in it, it became more in a way a, a mechanism to kind of engineer these experiences that were in part happening outside of the, the camera. Wow. This is something I've always wondered about photographers because, you know, we've had a guy named George Lang here who I think photographed numerous presidents uh, and a couple of other photographers. When you look through the lens of a camera, uh, or even, I mean, when you're walking around the world, do you see things through the lens of a camera? Because I think that as a writer, like I always tell people, I said, the problem with hanging out with me and I warn my mother of this is that, you know, everybody and, you know, everyone in my life is at risk of becoming material in my books. Um, that's just one of the occupational hazards of, you know, doing what I do. And my mom is always like, shit, you're going to put this in a blog post, aren't you? Uh, <clears throat> But I, I wonder, you know, for you, how does that, as, as a photographer, how does that affect the way you see the world? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, and people also ask me that, um, the correlative, you know, the correlative question of that is when the, you know, people know image think they say, oh, are you always like listening? Are you listening right now to what we're saying and like creating a visual diagram of this conversation? And I'm like, no, no. it's exhausting. Um, <laughs> to, you know, we're like mediums that takes a lot out of you, but yeah, photography is Yes, I think that uh, that even now, if I'm not actively making pictures, I have you can't divorce yourself from that, you know, from seeing the color, seeing the composition, um, and s you're just being delighted by the visual world. Um, however, I was never uh, a snap shooter, you know, I was never Gary Winogrand who carried his camera and took hundreds of thousands of rolls of film, you know, every single day on the streets of New York. Um, for me, I was, I kind of approached it more conceptually. So I would get interested in something, have an idea and then approach it, you know, bring the camera in kind of um, after it was thought through a little bit. Mm -hmm. Do you know, so I, I always feel like there's, there's different kinds of photographers. There's definitely the photographers that are, in the moment um, and what kept ca whatever captures their eye becomes, you know, becomes a photograph. Yeah. And then there's photographers that really think about it more, um, it more conceptually and then kind of go out and narrow their, narrow their lens, if you will, and narrow the, their focus um, around telling a particular story. Yeah. I think the 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 thing that's it, it's funny that you talk about that with visuals. I think for me, sound is like that. Uh, you know, when I hear things in a conversation, when I hear music, those are the things that really get my attention in that way. I guess partially because I produce audio. Mm -hmm. uh, so on that note, let's let's shift gears. Let's actually get into the work that you do at Image Think and this whole idea of visual thinking. Uh, you know, we've had a few people here to come and talk about visual thinking. Mike Rody, who did the sketch note. Oh handbook. yeah, love Mike oh, Rody. Yeah. Uh, I think David Gray, who was a friend of Mike Rody's, if I remember correctly, that was his mm -hmm. name. Like, yep. Uh, and I think for me, the challenge that I've always had with visual thinking is that my handwriting is atrocious, even though I now use a bullet journal. Um, and you see these like beautiful sketch notes and it's just like, well, mine don't look like that. So I hate looking at them. Uh, but let's, let's talk about the concept, like how in the world, you, let's say we're going to take something like the conversation you and I are having and translating it into a visual medium for ourselves. How would we do that? 
uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, I may be a little bit different than Mike Rohde in the sense that, yeah. uh, you know, listening to me talk about kind of the way I approach photography too, is it's kind of like, what is the concept that that's driving it? So for us at image thing, it's the visuals are in service of something else. You know, it's not just, um, it's not just you're doing it for the sake and the pleasure of doing it, which is also beautiful and valuable. And um, there's a high level of art can be a high level artistry. So, but what I would say to you when you're like, well, my handwriting is atrocious or we have clients all the time that are like, I can't draw a straight line. You know, I could mm-hmm. never do this. And at the end, if you look at it, um, some of the work we do at image think you see the final product and uh, how, you know, and, and it is compelling visually, but really the real power in it is of what it's in service of. Right. Um, so in the same way that it's not just about the medium thinking about your mastermind class, it's like, what is the medium? Can, like, what is the story it can tell in mm-hmm. service of that story? So, uh, so I work all the time. One of the things I love to do now is do, um, kind of workshops and trainings with, people who are not artists who don't consider themselves creative at all and show them that a, uh, my sister is a neuroscientist. So I've, I've have, um, had her vet some of my research around this, but you know, we are a large part of our brain is wired to process visual information. It's not just one component of the brain, right? It's many different regions, including the prefrontal cortex. So we have a natural wiring to process information visually and everyone can kind of harness some component of that to accelerate, uh, you know, to accelerate their retention, to help communicate. You know, I like to, to make people think about cave paintings, right? Like that's one of the most beautiful things about being human. It was the combination of early early humans using technology in this case, like a burnt stick and, you know, the artistry to communicate something and it was in service of communicating. So when we think about visualization, it's really in service of how are we supporting solving a problem for our client and helping them move to, uh, to that decision-making by, getting everybody's thoughts out there by making it tangible, by giving them a literal thing to look at, to reference when they have, you know, circuitous conversations or they're dealing with big, hairy problems. Um, So it's really, it's really in service of that end. So even if your handwriting is, isn't great, but you, uh, you learn a few skills, it like can make your note taking better. It could be like, if you're trying to plan out your next book and you need to, communicate that to your editor and you can't quite get that idea out of your head, having a few basics around visuals can really help move that project along. So for us, it's, it's less about the end product and more about just letting, helping the whole world understand that it's a tool. It's a very innate tool that we have. We all drew when we were kids and it it's, can be powerful even, um, even in the hands of somebody who feels like they can't draw a straight line. With Candy Crush Saga, the crush is real. For the first time ever, we're celebrating real crushers and their stories inside the game. Find out why they love playing, complete levels inspired by them, and win rewards they chose for you. For a limited time only, see why the crush is very real. With Candy Crush Saga, download now from the App Store or Google Play for free. Ends May 27th. Available to selected players level 25 and over. When I first started The Unmistakable Creative, I spent a lot of time emailing potential podcast guests just to get their interview scheduled. As you might imagine, this was really inefficient, and it led to a lot of back-and-forth email. Fortunately, thanks to Acuity Scheduling, it doesn't have to be this way for you. Clients can quickly view your real-time availability and self-book their own appointments and even reschedule with a click and pay online. You can collect everything you need to know about a client as soon as they book by asking clients to fill out customizable intake forms from scheduling, keeping all their information neat and tidy in one place. Acuity actually helps prompt your clients with texts and email reminders, dramatically reducing no call, no shows by accepting deposits or full up front payments. So you can use it for clients, you can use it for podcast guests, or any other kind of meeting in which you're having to send a lot of back and forth email just to get a meeting scheduled. 
So save yourself from the day-to-day drudgery of having to keep up with your clients and your busy schedule by using Acuity Scheduling. And for a limited time only, you can get 45 days of Acuity Scheduling absolutely free with no credit card required by going to acuityscheduling.com slash creative. Again, that's acuityscheduling.com slash creative. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Yeah. Well, it's funny that you you mentioned that we're all sort of wired to process information visually because it it takes me back to something uh, that I, I heard Adam Grant on the Work Life podcast having a conversation with Stephen Dubner and somebody else about learning styles and why you know there's sort of a lot of research saying that learning styles are nonsense. I, now I don't know how true that is. Um, I've not done the research, but I think that you, you pointed out something interesting, and I, maybe you have an answer for this. I'm one of these really strange people who, despite being uh, somebody who you know produces a podcast, I actually don't listen to podcasts. It is my least <laughs> preferred form of media consumption. Um, I find them to be too slow uh, <clears throat> because I think I process information visually. Yeah. And this is why I think I hated college so much because I had to sit and listen, whereas I read voraciously. And I, I create all these very detailed mind maps for the books that I read. Um, I do the bullet journal, which I think all of that speaks to this whole idea of visual processing. So why is that? Like, why is it that I, I'm just curious, do you have any research to kind of show like why somebody would be much more likely to prefer, you know, visual over audio as a medium, particularly somebody who produces audio? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can only give you my opinion. I'm not a pedagogical uh, you know, expert. Um, but I, I do, yeah, I do think that most, you know, most of us are visual, visual learners, for instance, I mean, something like two thirds of our communication as humans is nonverbal that we're picking up on nonverbal cues before we even make a decision about someone or before they speak. And I'm sure there's lots of presentation coaches and experts that can talk about this, right? It's not so much the word that you're delivering, but your tone, your pitch, your level of confidence, right? All these things that are not necessarily um, around the content, around the, the, the audio input of it. So even those examples, um, I think, underscore that there's a real primacy for us as humans to have process information visually, even when it's being given to us in multiple different forms. And I, um, I'm also a very big reader and, uh, I find, I do listen to some podcasts for sure, but I, I find myself more, I can get distracted easily or tune them out. Uh, if some if other information comes to me, whereas, you know, if you're reading or you're processing for me, processing information visually, that's going to kind of be at the forefront. Yeah. Um, and, and and I think that this is uh, this is something that we all are s- like so attuned to. Everything in our world is is visual at this point, and it's more and more. There's such a surfeit of information that we're bombarded by that I think that that's part of that's an explanation for why image think is in the world, and we've had the success that we had is because people need things to be broken down and mm. um, simplified and getting that complex information translated into visuals is a quicker way for people to ingest and make meaning of it. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, let's, uh, let's look at this through a tactical example. Cause it's funny because we had another researcher here who talked about even the way that you present content has a huge impact. Even the way that he's like, there's a reason people use subheads and, uh, the headlines, you know, headers on blog posts, because he said, you just because of the way that we read on the internet. So I wonder if we were to take something like a book, for example, 
and um, translate it? Or how would you take the concepts in a book and bring them to life with your work? I know it's um, maybe that's a very general book, but um, but I would say I would I wouldn't disagree with that researcher. We talk about informational hierarchy. So if you looked at like an image think capture, there's um, there's a lot of cues, visual cues that are signaling to you the informational hierarchy and the way. And I would make an analogy to. Um, to newspaper, like even online newspaper, right? You have your main headline, then your supporting point is kind of in a secondary font that's larger. You have the image underscoring that. Um, And we're doing that like an image thing visually all of the time. So um, scale, the size of the, of the text, the font of the text, uh, the spacing, something else that uh, is really important that people you wouldn't necessarily recognize is the way we use color Mm -hmm. is is structuring things hierarchical. So people love, you know, when Mike Brody was on or someone, when people are first, he would probably say the same things for sketch noting They're uh, they love color and they're just like, yay, it's a box of crayons, but you're actually, you can use structure it. So it's limited so that, certain color either signals uh, categorizations or it acts like a highlighter or it acts um, compositionally for the way for your eye to move through it. So no. those are all components that would be what we'd call informational hierarchy to kind of break those con- that concept down. So to a- answer your question about the book, um, we would read it and we would decide what are the, the main ideas. And those things would be elevated with all of those tools that I just mentioned to you to signal like informational hierarchy to the, to the viewer, that those are the, the main points. And then the, so the sort of stories underneath it, because stories are powerful would be treated. Um, you know, maybe they'd be visuals that would come in or they would be treated in a secondary way. So it's it's funny because I am thinking of, you know, as you might imagine, I'm exposed to like potentially thousands of ways to capture information uh, just based on the people that I've interviewed, ranging from people who are experts in note taking to people like yourself who are experts in visual thinking. And as I'm hearing that, I feel like, oh, what I'm thinking is that would be interesting because it'd be a combination of all those things put together which is, okay, what stood out to me in this book? What visuals could I use to represent it? How could I distinguish using the right colors? Uh, I guess, you know, part of me wonders if it would start to look like a blog post with a lot of illustrations, you know, tied together. Like even if we were to transcribe the conversation that you and I were having and we were to take this and do exactly that, my guess is that's what it would look like. But correct, I, I, so I'm curious if I'm thinking about this the right way. Um, I think it would, it would follow a similar logic. It would, it would, uh, it would be more organic than a blog post because a blog post is made with text and there's certain rectangles and there's certain fields. But what I wanted to say to you is I think we should do that yeah. before this goes live is have, we can visualize our conversation. I will um, absolutely get you a transcript right after we're done. Great. That was one thing we, uh, we thought would be really fun. Thing. Yeah. I think that people will get, I think that'll, that'll help people, um, you know, really kind of put the, put the ideas here, um, to use. Like, I think I, I always like practical examples with research like this. Um, and naturally as somebody who reads a lot, that's kind of where my, my first thought was, Oh, how do I, how do I transform the way that I capture information? Because, Right now, my my capture method is, you know, I highlight and underline a lot. I transfer my notes, um, but I've never really done anything visual to summarize any of it. Yeah, well, great. Let's try it. You know, um, I, I think it's also it's such a, a good way to process, to be able to process information. Um, you know, if you think about like Bloom's taxonomy of learning, right, the analysis mm-hmm. uh, and analysis is one level and then being able to sort of. Uh, ingest it, uh, yeah. synthesize that information is like another level of understanding. And so through doing this, you're sort of reprocessing it. Mm. Where do you find that people tend to get in their own way or stumble with this? And, and uh, you know, like, for example, somebody listening to this might be like, oh, that sounds amazing. And they'll go give it a try and say, oh, that sucks. Like that didn't turn out how I thought it was going to and uh, give it up. Because My ongoing joke is if I could, uh, you know, implement the advice of every single person I've ever interviewed, I'd be like the most superhuman person on the planet. Right, of course. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so your question was, where do people stumble? Yeah. Where do people go wrong? Like if you were to, if somebody listening to this basically said, okay, great. I love all of these ideas. How could I go put it into action in my own life? Right. Okay. Well, I would say in, um, my 11 years of, um, running image think we have trained a, a, a number of people, right. Of, uh, and it's interesting because when people come onto the team, they usually, they don't have any experience doing it. Most of them actually didn't even know that it was a potentially p- profession. So it was always really cool. Cause they're like, this is unbelievable. This is my dream job, you know, which feels <laughs> great as someone who's created that dream job. But what, uh, the first thing I would say a novice does, and this is almost across the board, seeing everyone, including myself, learn how to do this is, um, they, you, try to over capture. So, you know, there's a first a nervousness about your own skill to be able to edit and synthesize the information and make the determinant about what's important and kind of hold back. So people try to just uh, transcribe everything, right? Which is A, impossible because you're not a computer, but B, you're also not, then not synthesizing and organizing the information, which is sort of the value of what we do. So, right. um, what happens also is people start to, you know, because we read left to right, you're a big reader. So you right. We read left to right as they start trying to capture everything verbatim, uh, linearly, you know, so one point right after the other and back to mediums, I make the analogy of oil painting. Have you ever done any oil painting? You know, maybe I did when I was a kid, but uh, I don't have any recollection okay. of it. So, so this works for, for an artist as an analogy, but I'll explain it to you really fast because it's fascinating. So you think of these master painters, you know, like the Renaissance painters or Vermeer or uh, Raphael, um, Leonardo da Vinci. They're, the way that, you know, people are always like, wow, it's like the skin of these people glow and the light that's captured in these paintings is phenomenal. And that's because they actually, they start, they build it up in layers. So the first part of the painting is usually was all done in brown, like brown and white. And then they start building up different colors. So you might look at someone, uh, someone's skin tone and not realize that it's actually, there's blues under there, there's yellows under there, there's reds under there. And that's how the effect becomes so amazing. And so the analogy is, is that, um, you don't try to capture everything, but you also don't capture everything linearly. So you sort of move back and forth across the capture, um, getting the points that you can when there's a lull in the conversation or someone is sort of talking in circles, that's your opportunity to go back and put an illustration in where you need to. So the person, a, a graphic facilitator, someone, you know, or Mike Rohde or someone, they're, they're not filling up the paper left to right they're sort of moving back and forth as time allows building it up until it's done like wow. a, a master oil painter would. That, that is really fascinating because, uh, you know, we've been, <clears throat> we just finished uh, a, a project called the unmistakable book of wisdom where, you know, I was basically going and saying, Oh, what are the most fascinating nuggets that I could uh, pull out of each interview and then set, you know, basically illustrate them. I'll send it to you after we're done. But uh, literally we just got the finished version today from, from our designer and it's funny because I, I think unconsciously, I literally would just scan the transcript looking for, okay, what actually stands out here to me? Uh, <clears throat> like, as opposed to linearly going through it, say, oh, wow, that nugget right there, that's the one. And even when we do sort of narrative type stuff that is an interview uh, format, so, you know, for example, right now I'm working on a new one where um, I had my, my roommate and a girl he's dating go through the 36 questions that make anybody fall in love, and I'm going to make an episode out of it. And I was going through the transcript, and I was like, okay, that's it. That little nugget right there. That's how I'm going to start the episode. And it's like way down into their conversation. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, that's a great analogy. You're not, um, you're not moving across it just chronologically as it unfolds. Um, yeah. So exactly. And I think that that's the thing that maybe is counterintuitive to people back to the question of like, where do you see people with their trying to do this, get hung up. It's, you know, it's logical that you think you'd approach it that way, but right. Sometimes the the story, right. If you think about movies, like sometimes the story is best told backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is that this linear way of thinking is so embedded into our culture, because if you, I mean, the very structure of our lives from the time we're in kindergarten till the time we finish high school is linear. 
you know, I think it's only when you get out of the adult world that whole linearity thing just completely falls apart. And I, I think that breaking that is is one of the, that for me, I think, because I know myself, like I'm, I realize where I'm trying to get to this. I'm like trying to get you to give me like a step-by-step framework and I'm realizing, okay, that's probably not how this works. Yeah, that's true. Um, sometimes people ask me, you know, well, wait, what's the process? Like what's, yeah. The, yeah and they want, um, they want exactly like a, an operator's manual or an assembly, uh, assembly kit for how to do it. Um, and it's, it's, it's practice It's understanding some of the tools. And then a lot of it comes down to, um, to, to intuition and, uh, it's very human. It's a very human thing. Wow. Well, um, well, I knew you got to get going. So I want to finish with, uh, one last question, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the unmistakable creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? What do I think it is that makes somebody unmistakable? I think that it's usually about detail. You know, it's about being specific, uh, you know, being, and maybe, you know, that translates to being authentic, but I think about what a, like a powerful piece of art is and it can talk about these universal truths, but it doesn't approach it as universal. It approaches it as the very like human, the very in the moment to that person and in the specificity, that's where you get the real power to talk about uh, a universal human connection. So I think what makes something unmistakable is almost the opposite, which is like um, being being specific, being true to that moment, being that and, and showing up as yourself. That's the most relatable. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. This has been fascinating and uh, really, really thought-provoking and educational. Where can people find out more about you, your work, and everything else that you're up to? Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. This is, I mean, it's so fun to get to spend an hour in the day just talking about creativity. Um, so thank you for, for that. So if folks are interested in what ImageThink does, they can find us online at imagethink.net. Uh, I do, we have a book, I have a book called Draw Your Big Idea, which is using visual frameworks for, uh, for people to think of, assess themselves and kind of launch their own projects. So even if like you, you, you feel like drawing is not your thing, you can still use the power of, of, of visuals. Uh, we just map out different frameworks and ways to approach it. And my photography is online, um, and, uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for this and, I hope that you get settled into Boulder. <laughs> Absolutely. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Did you know that every Sunday, our community manager, Melena, sends out 10 key takeaways from episodes just like this one? All you have to do to receive it is sign up for our newsletter. Just visit unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter, and you'll get them delivered right to your inbox. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com unmistakable. With Candy Crush Saga, the crush is real. For the first time ever, we're celebrating real crushers and their stories inside the game. Find out why they love playing, complete levels inspired by them, and win rewards they chose for you. For a limited time only, see why the crush is very real with Candy Crush Saga. Download now from the App Store or Google Play for free. Ends May 27th. Available to selected players level 25 and over. 